today I'm on my way to meet Stephen Gillen, who is said to be one of Britain's most feared gangsters and armed robbers. After being forced to serve almost 17 years in a Category A high security prison for his crimes, Stephen is not one to shy away from his past. Mr Gillen also served time with Charles Bronson, who the British press have called the most violent prisoner in Britain. Today I'm here to find out more about the man behind this notorious cape. Stephen has invited us down to his home in Windsor to have a discussion about his past, his recent reform and his future plans of sharing his story on the big screens of Hollywood. Stephen Jidden, listen, first and foremost, thank you very much for taking the time. I know you're a busy man. There's been a lot going on in the world and I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us to share your incredible story. My pleasure, Leonard. Honestly, it's, uh, I've read you know, your book so far. I've looked at interviews um, and it's just astonishing how much you've been able to transform over the years. And I wanted to have this conversation because I feel like your story is a story that needs to be shared to the different generations. Um, and I feel like you've been able to not only be an example, but you've also been able to mould and, and recreate yourself over the past few years. And I think people could really learn a lot from that. So this is a conversation. This is not a right or wrong interview where there's you know correct or politically correct answers. It's really about truth because I feel like through truth, people can really learn. So I really want to, you know, just put that in the air. Now, you grew up in Belfast, you know. Yeah, yeah. I was, I, I was born here, but I was taken over there as as a baby. I was six months old. Wow. Uh, my parents, who actually come from there, mm. this was in the time of a civil war over there. It was really so. I and I come back to this country then, when I was nine years of age. Mm. Wow. How did Belfast mould and shape you initially before you, you know, before you came over here? How did that impact you? Um, first thing is, my mother left me there to come back to try and build a life for us over here. So I wasn't with my mother. So that was a kind of an effect, you know. The dynamic wasn't ideal how it should be. But I was with wonderful people over there, aunts and uncles, and they was wonderful people. They was religious people. But... Because of the trouble over there, I was very sheltered as a uh, child. But, um, you know, it's in the book even. You know, I see a lot of trauma over there, a lot of traumatic stuff over there. Um, uh, I see someone get shot in front of me. I was seven. I got caught in a wire. You know, I had to watch him die in front of me and call for his mother. You know, this took about 20 minutes, you know, and I was seven years of age then, you know, hiding behind the hedge. So, you know, if you could just think about stuff like that, that was horrendous for me. So, What was the impact so, on, on, on you at that time when, you, when you're seeing a human, a human being as a boy die in front of you? I think for me then, I mean, I'd been caught in a riot. They used to just start like that. The shooting would start from the flats, firebombs, cars overturned on fire, you know, all of this stuff, people, uh, rubber bullets. This was the scene and, you know, I ran, I hid behind a hedge as you do as a child for kind of safety. You couldn't go in the road, the shops was really, was really being traded. This, uh, this guy was only a young guy uh, now, looking back. Um, he had a gun, you know, he was shooting and, you know, they caught him, you know, he took a couple of shots in the chest, he fell back. So I was only a couple of metres away from him. But, you know, he was calling for his mother all uh, blood coming out of his mouth you know I mean I was really crying you know I mean I was absolutely terrified you know I was even trying to talk to him it was horrendous for me because no one could move and he was trapped there I was rooted to the spot so you know I had to stay there while he, while he, while he was dying a couple of people his comrades they come they pulled him back after a while but this was a long long time you know we're talking 20 minutes Leonard so it had an impact where that was absolutely shocking to me and I um it was an introduction to a world I hadn't known even though I was around this kind of activity and that certainly changed me to the point where um you know I would, it kept this down really and I didn't even speak about this alone in any detail to anyone till about 
seven years ago. So all them years I carried that. And your mum went away to come to find opportunities in London, correct? Yes. How 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 did you interpret that when you was when you were young? Did it feel like she had left, or did you? Did you? Know she was the truth is, it was very very hard. You know, and this was um, very hard for me to cope with. You know, uh, another part of that was my surrogate mother, uh, Madge, who you know, such a wonderful person, such a kind and beautiful soul. She died of cancer. This is one of the reasons why I was brought back over to uh, to England. You know, she died of cancer. So, you know, that was another real trauma for me. It's someone who was everything to me had suddenly been been taken. And then I'm, you know, I'm... I was the little child with the little suitcase, really, on the ship, going to somewhere I didn't know where. You know, I really was an alien place. And that's how that was for me that time. Did you feel responsible for yourself at, at that age? Or were you hoping someone would, would arrive and save you? <sighs> I think uh, I was an anxious child. It made me very anxious, this stuff that I've been through, this uncertainty, this being moved, it pushed and pulled all the time, you know, out at sea without a paddle, it was really like that. And I, this pattern would keep going for a lot of my life when I went on, you know, into the organised crime thing and ended up in prison, mm-hmm. you know, for over a decade, unfortunately. But um, so this was the start of the pattern, really. You know, when I come back to London, you know, although London was a fast place and uh, Belfast and the war zone was much faster, it was different. So I was getting in trouble really, really early. And it, it started to go wrong for me, really, when I come back. Of course, I spoke funny then, you know, and everything was different uh, for me. So I was different. So I had all that to contend with. So you moved to London, nine years old, Barnet Grove, East London. Well, it's not, yeah. Tell, tell me what, what that, just looking back at that time, how did that feel? What did that, what, did, what was East London like? What was the environment, atmosphere? Um, I've always loved London, you know, I have a lot of memories, you know, a lot of friends, obviously, you know, in East London. I, I grew up there. I have friends all over London, but the middle bit was for me, Leonard, how it was, was when I, when I come back to this country, don't forget, you know, I was nine, you know, I wasn't even 10 years, I was still a child, right? I, I didn't actually, I ended up in foster homes, you know, I ended up in foster homes and this was the start of a downhill, downhill spiral for me. I started to become really, really angry you know, and stuff like that. I uh, started to get behavioural problems, you know. I had to fend for myself, uh, especially emotionally, you know, in all intents and purposes. This was very tough for me, you know, in an alien place. Um, You know, so I always get uh, into trouble, a lot of fights and all this stuff in school. You know, I got expelled from school, suspended from school. This was the start of petty crime of kind of going out there on the street and all that and having a surrogate family, really. A surrogate family of street urchins, call it whatever you want, who was kind of just out there, you know. So, you know, I suppose in a sense, we, you know, we was really vulnerable, you know, and susceptible to that. So we kind of gathered together, you know, and we was these kind of guys. You, you mentioned growing up in the foster home. You know, what was that experience like? Um, it's in the book, you know, and I always say it how it is. Because of my criminal stuff then, silly stuff at the start, stealing cars, silly theft, stupid stuff, um, you know, my behavioural problems, right? Um, I was uh, given a care order by the uh, lo- local authority, so I was put into their care. You know, and they started moving me around to all different places. You know, I went to one place in Stevenage and it was um, it was actually like a prison for children looking back. You know, there was a lot of vulnerable, vulnerable children in there, you know, and I was, you know, I was only a little thin, little, little thing then really. I mean, it wasn't this big guy or anything like that. So there was really bullies in there, you know, and, you know, I wasn't having that and trying to stick up for the other younger children. There was a few of us. You know, and they put us through a lot of a lot of abuse. I mean, they'd lock me in, uh, you know, in 
boiler rooms and all this stuff in the dark with rats and all stuff like that. They was very, very dark people in there, you know. And, you know, so we'd run away. We'd run away from that. We'd come back to London. We'd steal some cars. We'd do some stupid stuff. And they'd bring us back. And, you know, this was this was a another pattern. What was your introduction to crime, the life of crime at that time? What do you think was, was the a point in which you started to really take um, steps into that, into that life? It was a, it was a, a progression, as, as I've said, you know, that's why I've kind of, you know, I've, I've given the viewers just a, just a little indication of how that went. It was a process. But I went to prison when I was 14 years of age. That was the first time, detention centre. Yeah. And, you know, I come out, it was the same kind of a thing. And, you know, then I went, used custody. You know, I went through that. So I was in and out, that kind of stuff. So when when they actually let me out of the local uh, authority care at about 16, and I went back to London, you know, and I was kind of free in that sense, then, you know, I was around a lot of the people who I'd kind of known, you know, guns even then, you know, I see my first gun and we was introduced to that stuff when I was 16 and around them times, you know, and we knew the older guys, you know, people in my family and they, so there was criminal, criminal, criminal elements there that was very heavy, that was seen as, you know, the faces, the chaps at that time, who was doing really, really serious crime, like armed robberies, post office vans, security vans, um, protection rackets, can't fit in. Drugs would come later, but serious crime. So we was groomed for that, really. We was, you know, we was lambs to the slaughter, really looking back for that, for that life then. So were you, would you say you were influenced or, or were you kind of, was it, was it innate? Was it something that you wanted to, to also pursue in regards to just being in that environment and being on top of the ladder? Was it, you know, what was it? Was it the, 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 the older guys you were seeing or was it you that wanted to be kind of on top at one point? I think it's, it's both. I think you're definitely groomed. We know that, you know, everyone does in that life, the older ones, to send people out there. You know, you get sent out there, we used to call it, right? So it's the older ones, you know, and um, using their influence, their wisdom and all this stuff, you know, to send other people out to do stuff, right, and protect themselves. But it's kind of like a rite of passage as well, you know, and you have to think of the way I grew up, you know, and I really had to fend for myself in so many ways. So I was really open to the bad elements yeah. and I ran with that. And one of the things I think it's important to say that I, where I had such an anger in them days, I was one of the guys who you would say really was a loose cannon. You know, I was gamer than everyone else. I was always up the front. I would do more than everyone else. Crazy stuff, you know, which looking back, I used as a kind of a defense, defense mechanism to, to belong and all that stuff. That just worked for me and that become a pattern. So of course, when you have a guy like that, I mean, looking back, these guys like that, these characters, they don't last long in that life as such. But of course, they're very useful. So, you know, the older ones, let's say, oh, you know, we've got one here, you know, a like-minded. So, you know, that kind of expedited my journey through the ranks, if you want to call it that, into, into more serious stuff. You, you have an aunt, Aunt Medge. Tell me, tell, yeah. tell me a bit about her. Oh, she is just, um, uh, just an unbelievable soul, you know, really. You know, you're talking about someone who you know, in them days, could have been married. She was engaged once, but it actually didn't happen. To, and she just always looked after the family, always looked after the kids, you know. You know, would be saying a rosary for every one of an eye. Everyone knew her, you know, the kind of character where even in that war-torn country with all the hatred between Protestants uh, and Catholics, when she would walk down the road, both sides would say, oh, you know, this aunt Madge, really, you know, she was really known. She was a wonderful character, and um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm very sure that she's followed me um, all the way through my life. Still, and you mentioned her saving your life in regards to being a protector while she was present. How how, how does she protect you? you I think, 
that. You see, a lot of people, you know, they say, they say, oh, uh, you know, you transformed your life and all that. Yes, of course. Uh, you know, the metamorphosis. But there's more to this this tale because I say, no, actually what happened was I had the, you know, the courage, I had the circumstances, you know, I had the opportunity to find my way back to myself because I always had goodness put in me. So in that way, they certainly saved my life from a young age because I had this good instruction that was put in me. I just lost my way, but found my way back to myself. So you've come from Belfast, and then you've gone to London, been in the environment around different people that were performing different criminal activities. At one point, did you feel your position or your ranking increasing? What, what, what age were you when you really started to realise, what well, have a bit of weight here? Um, I think uh, in them days that, that there's, you know, people have to understand that, they, you know, that, 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 that fraternity of the day in East London, there was a lot of people who was doing a lot of heavy stuff. It's, it's, it, it's a very close-knit kind of fraternity, you know, with the family I had and different stuff. And many of the people I knew all the way through London and different gangs, if you want to call it that, or firms we used to work with, there is a hierarchy. So when you're already in there, you're already somewhere anyway, right? Because you would know all the faces and different really influential criminal names of the of the day, right? So it was, there was so much going on, you know, and the nature of that life then is that you stick to your own kind of, kind of groups. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I knew, uh, you know, I knew the most influential people of the day, certainly, you know, the notorious people. And then, you know, I had three trials at the Old Bailey um, for armed robbery. Uh, I beat the first one, second one I beat the conspiracy at Rob, but I got possession of a firearm, you know, and the third one, of, you know, of course, was an ambush by a flying squad after an operation, surveillance, you know, all of this stuff. There were shots fired, it was very dark stuff, um, and um, I got 17 years after that. So. What we was in them days, really, really active at a, at a, at a high level in, in the seriousness and heaviness of what we was doing and the people we was working with, that translated then into prison, mm-hmm. which was a real gang culture again, but we was really trapped and that was very violent. So what was it that was kind of the, the reference to power at that point? Was it, was it money or was it fear? What, what were people responding to more? Was it the guy that was making the most or doing the most crimes or was it the guy that was feared the most? I think, you know, there's definitely guys that we looked up to, there always is, who was the ones we think, you know, want to be like him. He has all the power, all the money, all the cars, all the, you know, all the girls, right, all of this stuff. But when you actually get there, you know, you know and you realise that the life is not like that, because you know you're constantly paranoid Mm -hmm. you know you you can't really enjoy that money and your head is not like that anyway when you become that person it's very much like a curse in a way be careful of what you wish for because you might just get it looks great but to actually be there to you know to have to live like that is certainly all that glistens is not gold truth is i had addiction problems early on I mean, my thing in them days, there was, you know, we'd be out, all the usual stuff, you know, a lot of cocaine, all of this stuff, which really, you know, and the drinking and different stuff like this. I, I knew that that life was, was, was not for me, you know. I mean, I'd, uh, I'd had many instances, you know, I had people who knew me 25 years and had set me up to get me killed. So I knew that this wasn't the life that I wanted. 